As we've just learned, it takes a community to prevent and respond to elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation. While the majority of abuse occurs in the victim's own home, abuse can happen anywhere. In the next 30 minutes, we're going to look at a few imagined scenarios and examine what to do when abuse is suspected, who responds, and what can be done to protect ourselves and our loved ones. I'm joined by a panel of experts who know the resources available in Tennessee. Thank you all for joining us. Um, let's get started. We want to talk about two different scenarios today. The first of our two scenarios involves an individual living in a nursing home. A family member from out of town visits a relative in a skilled nursing facility and notices some bruising. The family member asks what happened and the resident implies that there was some involvement with staff where she was injured. She's afraid to share information, doesn't want to cause any trouble. And the family member inquires to the staff and no one has filed an official report. The staff says they aren't even aware of an issue. The family member is very upset and wants to know what to do next. What should that family member do? Let's start with you, Renee. Um, if there are suspicions of abuse or neglect, then they should make a report to Adult Protective Services. We then in turn would notify local law enforcement, the TBI, healthcare facilities, and the ombudsman, as well as the DA's office. Okay, so, so step away from that situation and make the call is the first thing to do? Yes, ma'am. Okay, does everyone agree with that? What, yes. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to note that under Tennessee law, there is a duty to report. Mm -hmm. um, so if somebody suspects abuse of uh, somebody like in a nursing home, mm -hmm. somebody who's been abused, uh, Adult Protective Services, mm -hmm. Renee's group, basically there, I mean, there's a state law that requires you to report. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be reported to Adult Protective Services. Okay. Now there's one interesting caveat in all that, and that goes back to the Ombudsman program. Um, and under federal guidelines, um, the, if the individual who is abused in a nursing home um, doesn't want to report and they tell the ombudsman, I think you're under the responsibility, you, you can't, you're not allowed to talk about it until that person gives you the authority to do it. Why don't you clarify that, Lauren? Where um, do you come That's in? true. Our program, um, we rely very heavily on that confidentiality with our residents. And part of that means that we don't share that information unless we've gotten the consent from them to do so. Um, but if that's the case, we would actually talk to the resident and educate them on, well, what will happen if you don't report this or you don't allow me to report this or someone else to report this? What could happen? Mm -hmm. You know, your, your next door neighbor could be abused as well. So, that's well where we But if today. someone contacted you, they're probably of a mindset to report this, correct? Right. So th how often do you deal with someone saying, I'm calling you, but I don't want anybody to know? Not very often. <laughs> I would think not. And I think it's also important to note that the facility itself has a mandatory duty to investigate any complaint of abuse, neglect, or misappropriation. In fact, federal law requires that such a complaint be reported to the Department of Health within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And the facility also must complete an investigation of a sp suspected abuse within five days and submit that to the department. Okay. Uh, interestingly, once we receive a complaint, anyone can actually file a complaint with the Department of Health. That includes the resident, the resident's concerned family member, or Adult Protective Services. And then we would send surveyors out there to investigate and look through the medical records and an investigative file to see whether or not we could substantiate that abuse in the skilled nursing setting occurred. Okay, is that the, the next step once it's reported? Is That's the next step. Okay. Is it relevant that the staff and maybe the administration, I'm assuming in this scenario, said we didn't know anything about it? And what if they say, let us look into it first? As Jim noted, there is a mandatory duty in the state of Tennessee to report any suspicion of abuse. So even if the staff says, we didn't know, give us a day, let us investigate and find out what's going on, it still needs to be reported? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so the staff maybe looks into it, finds out there is some implication with, maybe the administration looks into it mm -hmm. and finds out there is some implication with the staff member. Um, what might happen next with that facility or what should happen next? 
What should happen, as I noted before, is that the administrator would report to our complaint intake unit for the Department of Health, and then the department would go out and investigate, send a surveyor, which is our version of an investigator, to go out and can conduct an investigation. The next step from that would be is if our surveyor substantiates that abuse occurred, um, then we could potentially move toward discipline toward a facility's licensure or consider placing that person on the abuse registry, which the Department of Health runs. Okay. Uh, and the abuse registry is a very important tool in that anyone who has abused, neglected, or misappropriated property of any vulnerable person across the state may be placed on that registry, which is public. And I want to talk about that a little more because it, this scenario may be at a more basic level, maybe at the top they're doing all the right things, quote unquote, and there is an individual employee that's responsible for this situation. Um, so here, all these reports have gone out about the facility and, and, and maybe they're even sanctioned in some way, but what about that individual and what if the facility is doing things internally to deal with that individual? Staff member, I meant. Well, generally speaking, um, if an, an incident like that happens in a skilled nursing facility, uh, the facility is going to do its own investigation, of course, which they have to do mandated by federal law, and then potentially that, that employee could be terminated. Um, another important key thing to note is if that individual was perhaps licensed, mm -hmm. for example, a certified nurse aide or nurse, um, that individual could then be reported to the Department of Health for potential discipline on their licensure as well. Does it make a difference how the facility handles it as you pursue your investigation and what ultimately might happen? I mean, if they've been really aggressive and proactive and, you know, maybe they've gotten rid of an employee that they've trained, I mean, what impact does this ultimately have on that facility? They have a duty to investigate, and that would be one of the things that we would certainly check when we send a surveyor out would be mm -hmm. whether or not the facility followed the appropriate rules, regulations, and protocol to investigate abuse complaints. Okay. But remember that um, uh, you've got you've got eight people sitting around this um, mm -hmm. um, in this room who all have some expertise and all have a different per, uh, different. Uh, it's not a perceptive a perception, but it's mm -hmm. a responsibility in terms of handling a situation. So uh, health department is looking at it from the standpoint you've got a nursing home involved, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you've got the ombudsman who's an advocate, you've got all these legal folks around who are going to step in. Let's say, take the scenario again, in this case it was reported, right? Mm -hmm. So it's reported to a family member. So duty to report, that calls goes into APS, which is going to conduct their own investigation mm -hmm. uh, and figure out if the person is in a is in a safe spot. They have an immediate role in this type of thing. Mm -hmm. But law enforcement is here too. Right. So the, the, the facility may be working on something, right. but you've got all these other people <coughs> sitting around the room that there may be criminal charges brought. Well, and that raises a, a good question because I'm wondering how much coordination there is. I mean, and, and I would think you're looking at it maybe more at that individual level that I was talking about where yes, there's a staff member and maybe you're trying to find out if there are other um, residents Correct. perhaps that were impacted by the staff member. Tell me a little bit about what you might be doing. With right, so we would send an investigator out and interview the alleged victim, any witnesses, look through documentations, if they did incident reports. Uh, sometimes we do joint investigations with the TBI, local law enforcement. Um, once we complete our investigation, we would report back and touch base with health. Mm -hmm. um, if we found facility issues, for instance, that would not be underneath our purview, but more so health, we would refer that over. Um, we would, if we felt like that this was a, a, a crime that needed to be prosecuted, we would follow up with the TBI and even the DA's office okay. to, um, to, to see what next steps should happen. And, and what happens when that referral comes to you, Lisa? Well, as, as soon as the refer referral is made to APS, law enforcement is notified. Mm -hmm. At that point, we will determine that has a crime been committed or does it appear that we need to investigate this. We will go out to the nursing home facility. Uh, and time is of the essence when you're looking at a prosecutable case. So we would be there very soon, on, as soon as the referral comes in, uh, to try to find whatever evidence there is. If uh, we find that there is an assault upon an elderly victim, then uh, at that point in time, an arrest warrant would be taken out for their arrest. Uh, this may seem like a very simple question, but is this um, 
where does this fall? Is it an assault charge? Is, it, uh, is there a special category of crime for this? Well, in Tennessee, we, uh, we don't have a law that's really, that this scenario is gonna fit in. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be an assault, but it's not gonna be under the felony statute that we currently have. Uh, so at that point, it would, it would be a misdemeanor charge. Really? Even if someone's physically harmed? Yes. So does that imply that maybe the law isn't quite caught up with where some of these potential situations are? Yes. The, currently, the Tennessee District Attorney General's Conference has been working on a rewrite of all the uh, Tennessee statutes in developing just to protect the elderly and the vulnerable adults. Okay. So that's something that we're working on currently. Now is, and is that because maybe the uh, demographics in our society have kind of gotten ahead of the law? We have people living longer, living, uh, you know, in, in situations where they may be dependent and the law just hasn't kept up with the whole purpose in aging matters, which is more baby boomers and more people living longer. Is that what it is? Well, I think that's one factor. Okay. What are the uh, others? Yeah. Obviously, you're implying there's some others. We well, gotta... fortunately, our le legislators are now starting to pay attention to this division of, of people that's uh, not, no one has really has stood up for them and, mm -hmm. and looked at how to protect them. So I think our legislators are now starting to pay attention to that, and that helps us okay. when they start paying attention. Okay. We had, Jim, a, we had a senator, uh, Senator Rusty Crow mm -hmm. from East Tennessee. Um, who had an individual that, that um, I think was financially scammed. That started the whole ball in motion. This was a couple of years ago, it was like three years ago, and Senator Crow came down and said, we're gonna do something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you had Senator Douglas Henry, who had been a longtime mm -hmm. senator, who was also interested. All of a sudden, the, the, the ball started rolling, and almost everybody in this room got involved in some way and that's what it took. It mm -hmm. took something, and then it took a senator to say, you know what, we need to relook at this. And everybody started having different responsibilities. So your mm -hmm. program is coming at a really interesting time because in Tennessee, we're taking serious looks at all this. Okay. I know that APS has taken a look at their internal statutes. We're looking at ways to coordinate all this information because as you've listened, there are different entities that have different responsibilities. But if we coordinate, we're gonna do a much better job. Okay. And then the DA's office has been tasked with looking at our statutes and beefing them up. And yep. your report is due back to the legislature this January. January the 15th. Yeah. Good. So things Good. moving along pretty rapidly toward improving the laws, making them more appropriate for this particular population and Actually, the needs they, of this population. Yes, and in, and in January, uh, the district attorney generals are all mandated to have a VAPIT team, a vulnerable adult protective investigative mm -hmm. team together. And if you looked at the end of this investigation, mm -hmm. they will have all the players together to make sure that each one of us have done uh, what we can to protect our elderly. Okay. So that team is gonna be huge starting next year okay. into protecting the elderly in the state of Tennessee. That's good to know. I, I want to just ask real quick about the registry. So one, this registry is established. Yes. At some point, some of these uh, folks that aren't doing what they should do are going to be in it. Is that accessible to the public? Yes, it is. The Department of Health actually has an abuse registry website, which is publicly available. Mm -hmm. Anyone may access it, and you can put in the person's name or the person's social security number. Is um, it utilized? Yes, and actually Tennessee state law requires that any individual that is going to be working in a licensed health care facility be checked to see whether or not they are on the abuse registry. Okay, good. Our next scenario deals with a financial situation. Mrs. Smith walks into a credit union. She's been a customer there for years. Recently, Mrs. Smith has been accompanied by an individual that is not recognized by the workers. When asked who the individual is, she says, this is my good friend and she's helping me around the house. Today, Mrs. Smith wants to open a joint account with the friend and wants to move $5,000 from her retirement fund to the new account that she's opened jointly with the friend. Is that a red flag to the folks that work in the financial institution? It is, sure. it's, a, it's an immediate red flag. I think as a financial institution, we're in a unique perspective. 
that um, we have access to financial information, which most people are very protective of, mm -hmm. but we also have an opportunity to spot things for people that come in on a regular basis, customers that we know pretty well. And, and in a situation like that, um, one of the things that we look for is to see if it's if it's something normal that this person would do or if it's um, if it's some usual activity for them okay well and, mm -hmm. and in this ca case it's clearly not this is something that suddenly started happening so what can the bank or credit union or financial um, institution or employee what can that person do what can they do uh, well, one of the things that we would encourage a broker dealer or an investment advisor to do is to develop internal protocols on how to spot these red flags and, mm -hmm. and what to do when uh, they spot them, how to report them. Uh, there are actually several red flags in this scenario. Um, things you want to look for is, is the person reluctant to leave the senior side. Mm -hmm. um, are they not letting the senior speak? Have the customer, the long time customer, and the individual that she has brought in are interacting with each other, if there's some suspicious behavior there. Yes, and, and uh, to, to your point about um, the uh, financial institution, institutions being mm -hmm. able to spot these issues, uh, we're looking for the help of broker dealers and investment advisors because they're going to be the ones who are interacting with the seniors. Mm -hmm. So when they are able to spot these issues and report them to us or report them to APS, uh, we're able to do our job and, and hopefully prevent some of the fraud from happening. Okay. Um, what if the employee is concerned about, I mean, we're talking about uh, commercial establishment and customer service is important. So what if there's a legitimate connection here and they're like, well, I don't want to upset this customer that's got tens of thousands, maybe six figures in this invested with our company and she's been our customer for a long time. Yeah, it's a tricky situation. And um, there are laws that prevent uh, disclosure of uh, non-public personal information to third parties, but this would be a situation where it would be an exemption to that law. Uh, uh, Graham Leach Bliley Act okay. uh, allows reporting of suspected financial abuse of seniors and fraud to law enforcement agencies. Anonymously? They can, okay. yeah, yeah. So we wouldn't expect the investment mm -hmm. professional to be an expert. Mm -hmm. um, if they have a suspicion that there's fraud happening, if they would report that, then we'd be able to investigate it ourselves. But Mrs. Smith may find out, and, and she knows where she banks, so she gets yeah. offended and she yanks all of her money. Well, we kind of look at it from a, from a perspective of, as a financial institution, we don't want to regulate how people make decisions about their money. But on that same perspective, we also want to make sure that as a we hold a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that there is no fraud or anything occurring. So we would probably look at it from, let's just take a look and just talk to her and mm -hmm. separate her from the individual that she's with and make sure that this is really a genuine decision that she wants to make and she's not being coerced. Because uh, You mean physically, th that employee might say, Mrs. Smith, can we go and talk in my office? Physically separate them. Is physically separate. We would do something like, we need to have this paperwork filled out. Unfortunately, I can't do it in this office. Can I get you just to step over here and we'll complete it over here? And that gives us an opportunity to talk to them and just make sure this is genuinely what you want to do. This is, you're not being coerced. Um, that have you had an experience like this? We have. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, it's something that happens every single week that we're seeing um, cases of this. Um, do pe are there situations where people seem relieved that you have call them aside and now they feel like, okay, I can really open up and say this makes me uncomfortable. Or are they offended? No, we, to, so far we've not had anyone that's been offended um, because we explain, you know, our, what we're doing, we're just trying to protect you and protect your money. And I, I think people understand that and appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, but more often than not, when we separate them, we usually find out, oh, thank you for doing that. I didn't want them to know the information or I'm concerned for my safety. Um, but that also gives us an opportunity to identify there's a real problem here and that we would call Adult Protective Services or law enforcement to, to take care of it immediately.
And maybe people, maybe it's a, a teaching moment that people don't know what their options are. Maybe they think they have to have a joint account and this is an honest attempt to get help, um, utilize the, the assistance that they have. And you explain things like POA and other things where they don't have to get a joint account, but this person can help them. Right, and it's a great opportunity to say, here's what's gonna happen if you make this person your joint owner. They're gonna have ownership of the account. There are some other options to you. Could consider making them an authorized user, mm -hmm. or maybe they need limited um, amounts, and we can look at um, other options. So we use it also just to educate um, mm -hmm. customers about what, what the ownership means on the account. Okay. I also wonder about this particular type of, uh, maybe abuse isn't the right word, but it's definitely exploitation. And I would think people who do this are kind of serial um, offenders. So does the registry include this category so that someone doesn't just move on to the next city or the next town or whatever? Yes, the registry does have a definition of financial exploitation. Uh, for placement on the abuse registry on the basis of financial exploitation, it has to be a case that's been investigated by Adult Protective Services um, involving caretaker funds or caretaker misuse of funds. However, we may also place someone on the registry where law enforcement has gotten involved and someone like Lisa has prosecuted them and they have a criminal conviction, which we call a criminal disposition, and they could be placed on the registry on the basis of that criminal disposition if it is received. Okay. Is there any role with the Ombudsman's Office or anyone else that um, wants to discuss this? TBI, I would think, would have some involvement if it has to do with federal We money. do investigate a, a lot of financial exploitation. Um, the financial exploitation that we deal with is more caregivers within the home, people that are paid by the state, Medicaid or Medicare is paid for their mm -hmm. care, and these people come in and take care of them, and they develop a personal relationship with them and trust them and they end up giving them their checkbook and asking them to go pay their bills and mm -hmm. and they end up paying their own bills or just stealing cash outright. Mm -hmm. They'll give them their debit card and say go to the grocery store and they'll use that debit card and steal that or steal the number and go further from there. So we do investigate those types of cases. Now how do those usually come to you because it's a little more isolated than right. this type of scenario. Right. We get a lot of our abuse referrals through um, APS via the 1215, that's the document that comes to us and they are required by law to re report to TBI and we evaluate if it appears to be a criminal action or a criminal activity that we do um, investigate that. We work closely with APS as well as the um, another a few other departments that do elder abuse cases and we work together jointly and then we put our cases together and take those to the DA for prosecution. And then as part of judgment, we try to get put in place where they are placed on the abuse registry. Mm -hmm. So we work closely with a lot of these departments. We kind of intermingle and, and work jointly. How often are these cases prosecuted for cr criminal charges? These are very tough cases. We have a financial exploitation uh, statute, criminal statute, which makes it a D felony, mm -hmm. but proving that is gonna be very, very difficult. If you can prove that, prove that you can also uh, freeze their assets mm -hmm. so that if, if I've taken $5,000 from freeze you, Freeze the I can, victim, can freeze victims. The defendants. Assets. Assets. Oh, the de okay, gotcha, yeah, okay. But I think part of the problem with that, with prosecuting, is that a large percentage of these cases that we see in financial institutions are from unknown persons. Mm -hmm. A lot happens from people they've met over the internet. So um, scams. Yeah, scams and okay. people they've met over the internet. So a good portion of the time you can't even identify who it is that's committing the crime. Okay. And the, right. and the scammers are getting smarter. Explain uh, what you mean, Jim. Well, so uh, Renee and I uh, spent most of the summer touring the state listening to banks and credit unions, um, and I think it was the lottery uh, scam mm -hmm. uh, that we heard quite a bit about where somebody would come into the bank and want money uh, because they'd won the lottery. Mm -hmm. They'd been called and they had won the lottery and they needed $3,500 to pay the upfront taxes or something. And uh, the banks would say, you know, that's a scam and they would be told to tell the banks that we knew you were gonna say that, we, we knew you at the bank was gonna say that this was a scam and that you just wanna keep your money, and we were told that by the people on the telephone, who are the people who are scamming these individuals. Mm -hmm. And they go in once and they, they take out $3,500, $3, and they go home and they get called again and they come back and get more. And by the time they look up, Mm -hmm. their, their assets have been depleted. 
It's so the, the scammers are getting, they know exactly right. what we're looking for and they're getting better at this. It, it's well, the same thing, sorry, yes, it's the ahead. same thing with IRS scams. Uh, we do outreach throughout the state, so we'll go out to senior communities and when we dis start discussing scams, uh, I would say a good third to 50% of the seniors in the room will say that they've received a, a phone call that's an IRS scam. It, mm. It's someone claiming that they're the IRS, um, you owe money, you have to send it to us immediately. Um, and, you know, they're obviously uh, scared, but it, it's, uh, you know, they don't know where the phone call is mm -hmm. coming from. They disguise the number. Um, and, and maybe this is a good time to just give people the warning signs because it, it is so, this is such a vulnerable group because many yeah. times they're still old school, still use landlines, still, you know, answer the phone and are polite because, you know, that's just how we are in, in this part of the country sometimes. So what are the warning signs that you might be scammed? Uh, by phone calls or whatever? Uh, well, I, I think anything that is an unsolicited uh, investment offer is something mm -hmm. to be concerned about. Uh, any hard sell, you know, you, ha you have to invest in this now or you, mm -hmm. you have to purchase this item now or, or send this money now. Uh, that's something you want to hang up on, uh, you know, immediately. Um, any, anything that plays on the senior's fear, mm -hmm. I think, is something that you want to to look out for. Mm -hmm. I would just encourage uh, any senior, or any person who receives a, a phone call or any type of solicitation for an investment or an insurance policy to ask as many questions as you possibly can. And if they're, they're not providing you the mm -hmm. right answers or if they become aggressive and hostile toward you, you wanna walk away or hang up. Sometimes that's that's hard for people to do, and yeah. I, I know one thing that I have heard that you can do if you're just a little uncomfortable pushing back is to say, may I have your number so I can call you back? Because yep. if they're a scammer, it's probably not a legitimate place to return the call. Another thing to be aware of, if they tell you that you're going to be arrested because you haven't paid your taxes, we do not arrest anyone for non-payment of taxes. We do not arrest you for not showing up. Uh, mm -hmm. We do not charge you a fine for not showing up for a jury. Mm -hmm. That's another big scam that's often used. So, you know, if they tell you they're gonna arrest you, just say, yeah, I'm gonna call my uncle, the sheriff, and ask him if he has a warrant for me. I think they'll hang up. Okay. <laughs> and, and were you gonna say something? Yeah, the other thing to keep in mind is when people call you, if they can't tell you who you are when they call and they can't give pertinent information that only you would know, like social security number yeah, or they're going to call and say miss smith this is so and so from such and such an institute i'm calling about your doctor's a visit on such and such a day or i'm calling about your visit to the bank on such and such a day they're not going to say um we're calling about your recent visit to the bank could you please um, provide some information and if you, you can't ask them well what's my name if they can't give it to you then just hang up you know okay. just walk away there's no reason and again this generation today that's becoming elderly are the polite generation mm -hmm. they weren't raised to hang up the phone they weren't raised to be rude to people but they need to just hang up yes and and one final note your department of commerce and insurance correct that's correct. consumer affairs as well consumer affairs is part of the department yeah. so that would be another place that people might could call and say hey i got this call is it legitimate absolutely and all of our divisions work together so if it's not a consumer issue and it's a securities issue they'll they'll get it to the right place okay well, there's a lot more we could talk about, but we've run out of time. So I want to thank all of you on the panel today for joining us in this discussion, as well as you, our viewers. Remember, in Tennessee, everyone is a mandatory reporter. If you suspect someone may be at risk for abuse, neglect, or exploitation, call Adult Protective Services toll-free at 1-888-277. 8366. If there is an immediate danger, call 911. For more information and to see all of the programs in Nashville Public Television's Aging Matters series, visit our website at wnpt.org slash aging matters. Thanks for watching. Major funding for NPT Reports Aging Matters is provided by the West End Home Foundation, improving the quality of life of seniors through the support of nonprofit organizations in Middle Tennessee. The HCA Foundation on behalf of TriStar Health. The Jeanette Travis Foundation, dedicated to improving the health and well being of the Middle Tennessee community. Cigna Health Spring, additional funding provided by 
the Community Foundation of Middle Tennessee, and by members of NPT. Thank you.